to the North Hill Community Club members to ask questions first. Um, so with that, are we ready to start? Um, Tracy Buxton, City Council position number five. You know, on a rainy night, there's probably a lot of other things you might want to do, right? Strolling in the park. Just <laughs> kidding. Uh, so my name is Tracy Buxton, and I'm a current council member for the City of Des Moines number five and I'm running to retain my seat coming up here mm -hmm. and uh, I would say my platform is really the same as it was last time I ran to work for a safe green destination community supporting those three core values so I would say for in regard to safety uh, that includes promoting safety for the entire community so uh, I've, I've advocated on behalf of the community to the police force and to the staff and our leadership for, for safety features that different people would want in their community. I have advocated actually for the police force to the administration for things that the police force has want, have wanted or, or with legislators. I uh, have worked on uh, that route, and so as a result of my work in regard to safety, there have been changes and uh, little changes in our community. I mean, from a crosswalk sign to changes in park schedules and gates and things like that. So, and uh, I think a lot of you know that we're adding a couple of new police officers and some mental behavioral health support for our police force also, so as part of that advocacy. Uh, project and uh, so in uh, to the next point in regard to green I've been a pretty um, a pretty regular advocate for green issues especially in regard to our trees our tree canopy and our forestry fund so I'm always asking about that and how it's going got some questions in even as we speak but not just in regard to advocacy but I've been a real boots on the ground uh, person in the community in regard to that. I go to a lot of these restoration events and uh, and maintenance events in our parks, taking out invasives and restoring by putting in uh, indigenous plants. So, And then also just anything that comes across the dais in regard to this, our sustainability of our air and water or, you know, reasonable sustainability of our air and water. So I'm uh, I'm an advocate of those things. And then the last thing is in regard to creating a destination community. I feel like one of the things I always try and weigh is, does this item promote creating a destination community? And is it, you know, favorable to small business? Is it favorable to, to development? And I've, I've been a, an advocate here again, boots on the ground, an active advocate for our small businesses. Uh, you know, Small Business Saturday, also, and also when COVID hit, I mean, I personally went and visited, at, when COVID hit, every single eating establishment in this entire community and asked them, is there anything we can do to help you? And uh, so, whether it's big business or small business, I'm really, I work really hard. I'm on the um, South, South Side Alliance for Economic Development, so it's a regional, a regional seat. I'm the vice chair there and on our Economic Development Committee with the city. So really try and stay in touch with whatever issues could be helpful to our business community. And then, and even then, reaching out into the community or brainstorming about how we can either create education for the workforce or more sustainable practices or healthy commerce in our downtown or um, you know create and it's from in my interactions with the community both through campaigning whether it's door to door you know on somebody's doorstep or in a public event or you know or even personally I have a constant open invitation for anybody I will meet with you one on one and uh, I mean, I've, I've set aside a whole day, opened an entire day just to sit and wait for people to come and talk to me. So I am very available. And that's how I get my input. So how much more time do I have? 40, 37 seconds. Oh, <laughs> well, so I'd say that's how I built those core values. And when it comes to my decisions from the dice, whether it's 
creating, you know, evaluating our budget, which we're in budget season right now, or any decision that comes down across the agenda, uh, if it's like, I'm not exactly sure how to weigh this, I weigh it against those three core values. So that's that's how I stand as your council member and representative. Thank you. Thank you. Um, wait, questions? Anybody? For Tracy? Matt. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have one question for you. Maybe you can explain this a little bit more in depth. I know that you follow the the media or the the blogs and everything else, um, and there's a lot of comments on the brain and the gates. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate as to uh, the benefits and and everything that that goes on down there when there wasn't? The gates. Well, um, boy, there's so much that could be said there. The the gates were put in chiefly to create a revenue stream so that we can bond bond the activity down there, the the uh, building of the uh, the rebuilding of the bulkhead. But as a as a unintended consequence or an unexpected consequence is it really increased safety and upgraded the atmosphere down there and as a runner regularly running the park down there you know the trail there was nothing so unnerving as coming out of that trailhead and seeing a bunch of very large uh, young men you know smoking chemicals and playing music loud and having to you know I'm gonna have to go through that alone to get to the park and that kind of that doesn't happen down there anymore and I do hear from residents who live adjacent to the marina area that the and even a block over that uh, the whole atmosphere down there has really changed whether it's crime or illicit activities so thank you I hope that's what you're looking for any other questions all right well thank okay. you Tracy. thank, thank you, you. For your time. Next up, Gary Steinmetz. Thanks, Gary. Good evening to the wet, wild, and wonderful uh, fall of the Pacific North. Uh, deal cut to do anything. People get sick. land up in Packridge and it was started expanding what's now called Midway Park. And so all the parts of the city are starting to enjoy uh, recreational areas, areas where they can congregate, there's even a uh, community garden up there, uh, and it needs to be maintained. Parks also includes after school care in our Parks and Recs Department because we need to take care of the kids uh, while their parents are working. And that really is an obligation I think that the city uh, should explore. When my kids were growing up, they're both in college now, uh, and they don't need after school care, sort of. Um, you know, we were lucky to have somebody at Woodmont Elementary School who was there after school and helped take care of the kids. I think that was a great program, uh, and it was very affordable, and it just provided that gap in the day for some adult supervision. And I think we need to really look hard at how we can fund that back again. Um, pavement, you know, it's about the streets. <coughs> That's really sort of the quality of life that the city can provide. The city needs to be sure that streets are paved, uh, they're picked up, they're doing the things that make this a nice place to live. And if we're not doing that, uh, then I don't think that City Council is doing its job. We were started to do some paving uh, about two or three years ago. Unfortunately, COVID put the, uh, the stop on that, but we need to make sure that it's built into the budget so that there's a regular steady stream in order to fund regular steady paving of all uh, the streets in this town on a regular basis. And it's like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. Once you finish, you just go back to the other side and start again. And then lastly is planning. Planning is kind of the fun part. 30 seconds. 
because that's where people get excited about this. But we've got a lot of big projects that need to be done, and we've got a fairly limited uh, budget to do that with. This council has decided that the marina uh, is the first priority, and things have started there. Uh, I think that's a good place to start. I think it is the uh, front porch to our city, if you will. And so it's an important piece to do that. But as that gets done, we need to focus on downtown. We need to focus on trying to figure out a solution uh, to um, the Masonic uh, retirement home and how we can keep that in the community. And so those are the things that I would like to do uh, if I'm elected. Thank All right. You. All right. Uh, questions? Yes, sir. You, you mentioned about how you want to work with children to get them to the point of, uh, of where, where you want them to go. What are the specific plans? I couldn't quite understand you, I'm sorry. You mentioned that uh, you're working on a plan on plan to get the children developed to the point where you would like to see them to be. What specific plans do you have in mind? Is this the after school care program you're asking about? Yeah, after school or in school, whatever program. Yes, we already had we had an after school care program that was fairly extensive, and that's the model that I would use to go for. And what it does, what it did, um, in my own experience, is uh, there were um, they had uh, two people uh, who were local students, college age students, maybe a little bit older than that, who were doing part-time jobs and they would come into the school and care for the kids. One of them was a former um, also a point guard for the Rainier Rams and would just run my kids ragged on the basketball court and that was great. There was another one there that would do arts and crafts with the kids who preferred to do that and so there was some uh, different kind of uh, activities because not one size fits all and they have to be creative about that. Uh, but that's, that's the plan or the model that we follow in trying to put that after school care back into the schools. Yes. You, you, you talked a lot about police uh, support at the beginning of your, of your speech and I'm wondering, mm -hmm. we still have the two safe waves that are rough areas and we still have a lot of probably minor crime, mailbox thefts, car thefts, lots of it going on right now. Mm -hmm. What is are we? You know, I, just, I heard we're increasing two officers. Is there any plans for that, or any plans to increase from that too, to make this? I mean, to, it seems like as we, we we become more acceptance of certain level of crime, where I don't think we should. Yeah. I, well, I, I don't think people are accepting a certain level of crime, and that's why uh, the city's trying to respond to it. Um, I think the city needs to respond to it by putting more cops on the beat so that they have a faster response rate. Um, one of the other things that we can do uh, is to try to make sure that those who are committing those crimes uh, and get convicted of that, and I'm a former criminal defense attorney, so you know I really do understand people who are committing crimes and the multitude of reasons why people do that, um, that they have the resources that they need to sort of get their life straightened out a little bit. One is that we have some real issues in society that may be on the scope of what a city can do. But a city can provide more police department and a better criminal response. Thank you. I'm Matt Mahoney. I'm your current deputy mayor. Uh, a little bit about myself. I've been uh, a member of the North Hill Community Club for about eight years and a trustee for six. I'm a U.S. Army veteran. My wife and I chair the water line. I give at least 30 or 40 to the city. It's going to feel the same way. Um, I ran, and I'm still sticking to what I ran, is, is to move this town forward. When I started, I read a co document that described our town in 1962. And unfortunately, little had changed when you look at downtown. What I believe is that the marina development is actually the catalyst. Once we get the marina developed, we have a private property in the downtown area. Well, that requires uh, a desire for people to come here with amenities that they want to make an investment in our community. And I'm talking developers as well as investors and even business owners that want to come here. So that's why I truly believe that 
we need to develop the marina because it is our port, as somebody else said. I thought that was a great reference. That's what brings, that's what brings enthusiasm. That's what brings vibrancy to our community. That changes what we look at every day of 1962. The truth is downtown's private property. We got a lot of land bankers there. No, no, you know, no, nothing else but that. The truth is we make it attractive for people that can really buy these properties and develop them. That's what we're after. Something like the theater is a glance of what I think the future is going to be in our town. We want, of course, keep that small town filled. We want to protect our views and all those kinds of things in mind. And the waterfront down of Redondo is just as important, and we've got some great plans there. Um, I'm a... Uh, I'm really big on the, like, Pack Highway 2. We've got the light rail station coming in. We've got the, you know, light rail station across from Highline College, and that's going to be important. We've got some great opportunities to build quality, affordable housing and give people opportunity to commute into work and have a great place to live in our community as well. We can do that throughout, throughout that area. Um, I'm a huge guy on public safety. I was a big advocate with some of our American Rescues Act to fund police. I wanted four. You know, in the compromise, I settled for two and a mental response person, and I would have taken four and a couple mental response for people as well. Because the thing is, is what's happened here is a lot of people don't realize is, so particularly lately, there's been some policy change. King County, the prosecutor, is downgrading felonies to misdemeanors or outright dismissals, so he's pushing the problem back on the cities. We've had some recent state legislation, honestly, that where the pendulum maybe have been swung too far. And unfortunately, with COVID, which has been, if they're not an imminent threat, they're not keeping them in there. So the problem is you've got career criminals out there, and that's why you've got an uptick in violent crime. So what we can do is add more police officers, why this all gets sorted out and figured out, and money gets fun and funding and solutions, and we want to get there. But with, our, with more police, we can at least do a deterrence and uh, protect, our, protect our folks as best we can. It's a reality we're facing. Uh, I believe in improvements in parks. Um, I fully supported us procuring additional property and the playground equipment we put in there and so forth, and I'll continue to look for opportunities. We're working on some parks and trails. Um, paving, I wanted to talk about that. We've actually been paving streets up here, and it was a great partnership with the water district, right? The truth is, is we were able to pay half. Paving's expensive. It's a million dollars a mile. Right? So you can work with partnership with the utilities and get it done. And an example was on District 54 on 8th Avenue, as well as the 11 streets we're going to be paving up here. And we've done um, 223rd and, and 216. So we've been paving roads. We've been using the money allocated for that to get that done. Um, I'm big on the fiscal responsibility. The fact that... How you doing? Uh, great. Um, so we talked a little bit about safety and policing and, and uh, increasing our police force. <coughs> I haven't been involved in politics in the mornings at all, but you know I read my city currents and I was shocked earlier this year to look at the they had pictures of all of our police department and it's a very very white group. and we have a very diverse city. Are there any attempts at creating some diversity in our police force? You know I asked the same question and I'll give you the answer I got. They, 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 uh, they actually really try hard to apply. It's, it's been amazing um, at who applies at our force. We've been, we've, been taking who it, we've been taking the best candidates we can get, but I agree with you, we need... Yes, sir. The last time I talked to you, last time I talked to you, yeah. we were in the street corner in downtown at, at, at the morning stadium. Yeah, um, yeah, Big Catch Plaza. Yeah. I remember. I remember that. Now, when, when, when you said well, the what you're trying to do to increase the participation of the citizen group in the law enforcement, what exactly in mind is that? For, for, for you know, public participation with the police force? Yes. Well, I support a police advisory board, which we have, mm -hmm. and there's a, there's a diversity board as well, which I support as well. Um, and I believe in... Uh, having the police, like when I hear about events in the city and so forth, I always notify the chief and I try to get the police to show up to, to you know, have conversations and be, be available to the public. Um, I'm really proud of our police force. We're one of the, 
most modern um, thinking groups, we're going to support the body cameras. We're doing using drones. We've all we were already using de-escalation check uh, de-escalation techniques. We were uh, using the eight ways, um, as well as um, uh, what, was the, what was the word I was looking for? We uh, we we. We, we, incur, we tr we're always trying to find a new one where mental response is what I was looking for. We're looking for the best ways to do the, what I call modern day law enforcement. Mm -hmm. That's fair, Justin. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Next we have uh, Priscilla Vargas running for council position number three. Good evening, everyone. It's nice to see friends and neighbors uh, and opponents. <laughs> uh, I uh, am thrilled to be here tonight. My name is Priscilla Vargas, and I'm running for position three for the city council. It is currently being um, uh, held by Louisa Banks. Uh, it means a, much, a lot to me to have you here tonight and to take the time to have us come and meet you in person. Uh, it is a very challenging time with COVID, and I know that some of us are like this where we're not even wearing a mask. Eventually, maybe we'll get there. Um, it's, it's been a long time. Uh, I wanted to just share a little bit about me. Um, for some of you that may not know, but I uh, uh, working with seniors and people with disabilities. And um, my goal from point A to B, especially people with disabilities that um, have maybe a, a little bit more challenge when it comes to getting from point A to B. And so it's been something that I've been involved with for over 30 years, actually over 31 years. Uh, so it's, it's something that, I'm, that really means a lot to me. And uh, so about three years ago, I pursued a, a position with the uh, Des Moines uh, Senior Services Advisory Committee. Uh, it's a mayoral appointment. So I've been on that committee for about three years. I wanted to really give back to the community. And that was my way of starting um, to get involved with the city. Uh, so it kind of gives me a good opportunity now to pursue city council with who I've met, the kinds of work that I've done. Uh, and so I, I really believe that um, I can bring a different perspective maybe than what is on the council at the moment. Um, uh, being from a transportation background and also a background with uh, working with people with disabilities and seniors. Uh, if elected, my highest priorities include public safety. I am endorsed by the police guild, and it's really a big deal to me, um, as it should be. Uh, I have uh, done several ride-alongs, which has been enlightening. Uh, not too much excitement, but I guess that's a good thing in a sense. Uh, but there's more opportunity for, for ride-alongs. So I've, I really look forward to uh, uh, being on the council and being more involved with public safety and emergency <coughs> management uh, group and, and, and uh, being involved with that, that uh, effort. Uh, economic development of uh, the Des Moines uh, Marina and the Redondo Marina is certainly way high on the list. And revitalization of downtown um, and the surrounding neighborhoods. And of course, uh, a, a, a affordable housing is, is, is important. Uh, it's not necessarily um, something that I have talked about very much, but I think it's important. Um, and job creation to me is even more important with, a, with the opportunity to have a livable wage. So all of those things are important to me and they're, they're my highest priorities. Uh, certainly, uh, I have not been uh, an elected official, so I don't have the, the experience that Tracy has and Matt has uh, speaking this evening. But what I'd like to say is um, I, I really look forward to the opportunity because I think, again, I can bring uh, a perspective uh, with my skills and my expertise uh, to the table uh, as a collaborator, as someone that is transparent, and someone that wants to really build consensus. So um, with that, uh, I uh, have been endorsed, like I said, from the police guild. I just recently received an endorsement from the Seattle uh, uh, King County Realtors. Uh, Several of the members of the uh, council have endorsed me, and I know individuals, and I appreciate that, that endorsement. Uh, I've also had the endorsement of the 33rd uh, District of, of Democrats and the Diversity <coughs> and Inclusion uh, Democrats. So with that, uh, I hope that uh, you've gained some a little background about me uh, and where I'm at and what my interests are. 
Uh, certainly look forward to your questions if you have any questions this evening. Okay. Any questions? Sure. You mentioned about economic development. That everybody who's running for any office anywhere in the country measures economic development as one of the most important things that goes on in our society. What exactly do you have in mind? Well, economic development, again, it, it, there's a lot, and I think you know, previous speakers have already said, we have a gem in this city. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity in the morning for more economic development. And I think that one of the real gems is the marina. And uh, so with the development that is underway, that's being planned, uh, that's going to really bring a lot of opportunity and a lot of business into Des Moines. Mm -hmm. And um, that's really what I'm referring to. It's just giving us more uh, opportunity for growth in, in, in our economic arena so that we can be even more successful as a city. I mean, one of the things that Matt had brought up, development is going to be really critical for the city to really maintain and evolve and become even stronger. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Well, yeah. You talked about um, job creation and livable wage. What do you think of livable wages for, let's say, a, a single mother with a small child? What do I think of livable wages? Yeah. What would that be? Uh, I would say uh, certainly living in Washington State, in this area. Yeah, in King County. What in King County. Yeah. Uh, a, a livable wage would be at least on an annual basis, and again, I'm just haven't been asked that question before. Um, I would say at least, you know, fifty to sixty thousand dollars annually, probably a lot more, maybe a little bit more. I know the median is about seventy thousand, um, because it's 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 difficult, especially depending on where they where you're living. Uh -huh. So assuming they're living in Des Moines, mm -hmm. and if well, that's little, what I mean. Yeah. So if a little, let's say you said seventy thousand, so that would be mm -hmm. I don't know thirty some odd dollars an hour. How would you um, be able to help create jobs of that amount in our community? Well, I, I think it takes it takes more than just me. It takes a, it takes a team, uh, and the city council is just one entity, one group of group of people that will be working with the city manager, the staff, to come up with ways in which that could become more than where we're at now with the livable wage that we don't necessarily have. Uh, you know, we're looking at minimum wage and the requirements for minimum wage, you know, at $15 an hour. So um, I think minimum wage is $15.50 an hour. $15.50? $13.50. $13.50. $13.50. Well, it's 15. It's 15. It's 15. Okay. We've got time. I'm sorry. We're good? Yeah. State 15. So here in Seattle, 15. 15. Federal 1350. Okay, thank you. I thought it was 15. Thank you so Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And we're good, right? Yes, we're good. Oh gosh, thank you to the North Hill Community Club for inviting me here today. Um, you know, my name is Soleil Lewis. I'm running for City of Des Moines City Council position number seven. I am a special education teacher. I'm also a proud Teamster 763 union member. I'm endorsed by Congressman Adam Smith, the Representative Tina Orwell of the Amazing 33rd District, and also the Washington State Educators Association and the MLK Labor Council. I'm here today and the reason why I'm running for City Council is because of a 3.6% sales use tax that went into effect in our city. And there was no vote from the 31,792 people who live here. Imagine that. No vote. 31,792 people who live in this great city. But moreover, that means that anything you buy in Des Moines is affected by a sales use tax that you did not receive a ballot on. So you think about the real life implications of this. When you look at your daughter or your son who has, let's say, diabetes, you have to now tell them, I'm sorry. 
not because of the fact that it's my fault, but I'm in a situation now I can't buy insulin for you because I now have to pay for taxes that I did not get a vote on. And I do not want anyone in this community to not have a say in how their tax dollars are being used. The other factor in this is that because we live in a city of 31,792 people, we also have a situation in our city where only 31% of our total population will shop downtown and spend their tax dollars in our city. They would rather go to Burien, SeaTac, Des Moines, and if we truly are talking about economic development long term, we also have to look at how are we supporting our businesses reflective to the aesthetics and how our businesses look, the grant supports that we could provide in partnership with a better relationship with our King County Council member, and how our grant flows and how we are actually connecting to not just the 30% in the marina, which is great, but the 70% that live in every other area, Woodmont, Zenith, and North Hill. And that is the reflective change that we need to see in this city moving forward, and that is why I'm running, because I reflect that, of living in Woodmont, seeing how people that look like me are not always at the table, but they're always there for the vote. So that's just me in a nutshell of why I'm running for City of Des Moines City Council position seven. So, yeah. questions? Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay, all right. Last round of the three minutes. Okay. Questions for Sarah? Yeah. I, I was very upset when I got my last Currents magazine and saw there uh, activities for kids. There's nothing, absolutely nothing. Activities for seniors, absolutely nothing. I mean, I grew up in a town of you know 13,000, and we had activities for kids. It wasn't even an incorporated city, but that was the priority. We had, you know, there was softball, there was day camps, there were after schools, there was arts and crafts at the, you know, the, the playground. There was nothing here. I, 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 I just absolutely don't get it. I mean, so here we have, we're paying this extra money, mm -hmm. but then there's nothing. Mm -hmm. So here we're, we've got a parks department, and, and we've got, you know, the, the highest paid city manager around with a great big nice fat salary and ongoing and blah, blah, blah. And if I hear one more time about this great rating he got us, well, that's great. But, you know, we certainly have paid for that. But what do the kids get out of it? A big fat nothing, you know. So if, if, if this is a city for everyone, well, then the kids need to feel part of it. And here we're paying, but again, what are, you know, what, what are the kids in Woodmont getting out of it? Yeah. The biggest thing that I can tell you is it's also about actually when I speak to people in my community of Woodmont, but also North Hill and every part of Des Moines, they tell me that I do not have accessibility for my kids for daycare. That's a big issue. Mm -hmm. And the other issue too in our city is that we need to implement a grant administrator. We should have proposals when the American Rescue Plan Act funds came down the line. There should be consideration that we have hired a grant administrator, someone to provide oversight to also even looking at Best Starts for Kids, the levy, that we can track the money and also make sure we have a plan in action. Yeah. Have you thought about, instead of city council, have you ever thought about running for the school board? Oh gosh, no. I think for me, the biggest thing that I could see is as a teacher. You're, you're talking about yeah, yeah. is for yeah. uh, well, the Highland uh, School District. It has nothing to do with the, really the here. Okay. So the biggest thing that I can say as an office manager working in the Highline School District is that the city is always in relationship with- So you with work the at the Highline School District also? No, I used to be uh, office manager Highline School District. And one thing that I can say 
is that the Highline School District is always in partnership and working with other cities. So another factor that you have to think about is that when it comes to daycare services, when I was an office manager, I had to deal with parents calling me day in and out saying, how do I get daycare services in Des Moines? Who do I contact? I find that the city of Des Moines had partnerships with certain daycare services, but those daycare services were not free. So if you were making, uh, you were lower income and you did not have the money available to pay for daycare services, it did not benefit you, that partnership. And it, that is why I'm running for city council as well, because everything is always, always interconnected and you can never get away from that factor, so yeah. I just had a clarification, a clarification question for myself. The 3.6% in use tax that you said was Des Moines only, are Sales? you talking about the King County mm -hmm. one that went through? No, no. At the peak of the pandemic, 3.6% uh, sales use tax went into effect in our city. It was went into effect from the city manager. This is in the city of Des Moines. How that works is that sales use tax affects anything that you buy in Des Moines, but moreover, the reasoning for why it was implemented was due to the fact that there was failed revenue, there was a loss of revenue um, due to the pandemic. You will see in our 2020-21 ballots, um, you will see in the city of Normandy Park. Snacks and refreshments back there, so please take a, let's take a five minute break and we'll get back to speakers. Yeah. 
since the Great Depression, and uh, we got the taxpayers, 64% of the taxpayers agreed that having something for our kids, a place for our kids to learn how to swim was important. And after that, I was asked to help do the same thing with the uh, city of Tukwila and help save the Tukwila pool. Uh, this is an example of active you know, participation areas that, uh, that our kids really need. And uh, I then, uh, in 2014, uh, became the president of the Women's Legacy Foundation. And our efforts uh, have always been to support uh, disadvantaged youth and seniors and to enable them to participate in the Park Rec program. So I've had a lot of uh, you know, experience in the community, uh, a lot of uh, volunteer service. And so right now what I'm doing is, the reason I'm running is I'm really concerned about what's happening with, to our kids, uh, particularly within relation to you know, the COVID uh, pandemic. You stop and think that kids are in school for 13 years, K through 12. By the time, we're, we're actually rapidly approaching two years that they're, they're going to have disrupted education. This is a serious, serious problem. And we need, we're not, the, the uh, teachers at this point are not particularly getting any help from the city. Before the pandemic, we had you know, very active programs, uh, before and after school programs, uh, you know, uh, rec programs uh, for the kids to, uh, uh, you know, participate in. These are very, okay, these are very important and it's, a, it's an active uh, process that we have going here. Kids are actually involved and there is programming. Unfortunately, what I see is happening with our parks right now is we're going to a passive program where basically what it is is that 
we will have uh, opportunities for uh, kids to go and play at a park, but really the only thing the city is doing is mowing the lawn. There isn't the opportunity to, you know, have... Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Questions? What position are you running for? Uh, position three. Thank you. Okay, anybody have other questions for Gene? Oh, I'm putting I'm putting the tripod. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I have one. So what, what kinds of things would you like to see done? Well, okay, one of the problems we've got right now is, you know, particularly now with the pandemic, we do have a problem with, uh, uh, you know, we're down to one after school location uh, in the city. The kids are having to be bused to the field house. It used to be at each individual city and we, it's individual school, and we used to also have uh, before school programming. Okay, the rec programs are out, and which I'm really disappointed in Dwayne's response to this because if you look at Burien, uh, because it's online, normally it has to be an even number, but they have a 23 page uh, brochure of activities for kids and seniors to do uh, this fall. It's 24 pages in Federal Way, it's 24 pages in Kent. 16 pages in CTAC, it's 40 pages in Auburn, we have eight lines. Eight lines, okay? People talk about, uh, you know, uh, police, policing and public safety. The, when you talk about juvenile crime, it happens usually between 3 and 6 p.m. The number one way to stop that is to have, you know, supervision uh, and activities for the kids to, you know, participate in. We're not doing that. We need to restore that. Yes. Okay. I, again, I don't know what you guys are doing, but why don't you bring this up to the school board? Why, why not go to Highline and say, get your act back together? It's not the school district. It, it is the school district's problem. It, yeah. it is not the school district's responsibility. If, if they take and, and spend a little bit more money on the students and forget all. In fact, what I'd like to see is the school board go after the Highline School District and say, we're whacking off 33% of the top people at the, at the uh, office. You're out of here. We're going to take those funds, we're going to put them back into the schools for nurses and for councilmen. We have no council in the schools. Our students have no way to talk to a, a counselor to go on. Our, our, our school system here in the Highland School District is horrible. Just horrible. Look what they've done to our premier Mount Rainier. They have killed it. Okay. I, I, well, we'll get to your comment. Your comment was your comment was that, 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 that school, the school, the school, school. about and parks and they want to be sponsored in the school. We're talking about parks and rec. We're, yes, exactly. It's parks well, and rec. Well, they've got parks and rec and forget about the school, school, school. We're talking That's about the parks and rec. rec. Everything has been about the school system. But that's where the kids come from. Educating our children is probably, you know, people talk about our future. If we don't educate our children, we're going to be in deep trouble. Mm -hmm. okay. Correct. I don't and there has oh, always we haven't, been... We haven't educated our children for the last 18 months, have we? There has always been a partnership between the cities... The last 18 months, the, the Highland School District has done nothing for our students. Not true. Nothing. I, I would disagree with you, but there has always been a partnership between the, the uh, cities through the Parks and Rec Department and the schools. You know, there is, there's that time period that schools are dealing with the students and, and you know, direct education. 
But as far as other activities, which, you know, you know the, the uh, rec leagues, those are important learning situations. So but those are basketball or baseball. I don't, to, I don't need to stop, but we've yeah. 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 gone through our time okay. already. So uh, thank you, Gene. Okay. Ed Doviak, Council Member uh, Position Number Five. Hi, thank you, uh, Northville Community Club, for having me uh, here today. Uh, I'm running for Position Five. I am running for City Council because I like to help people. Um, I really, uh, in my community, um, I've been in Des Moines for 14 or so years. Um, I am a block watch captain for the last 10 years. Uh, um, if you don't feel safe going to a park, you're not going to go to a park. If you don't feel safe walking to school or walking your kids to school, you've got to drive them to school. And that's not good for the environment. That's not good for your community. If you don't feel safe taking a walk around your neighborhood, walking your dog, uh, taking your kid out in the stroller, you're not going to do it. And that leaves uh, that leaves our communities more vulnerable. And so by enhancing uh, public safety, uh, in, uh, uh, really supporting the police department and trying to keep crime down where people do feel safe, uh, safety um, as being one of their priorities. Safety goes hand in hand with everything else. Um, one of my other uh, big issues is economic development in the area. Um, I would love to see, and I brought this to the city council a few years ago uh, in public comments, um, is I would love to see like a cohesive signage in our downtown core. Um, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm no esthetician or anything, but um, the mishmash of banners and you know, temporary signs and you know, everything that's down there, I would really like to see kind of you know, something like you see in other little seaside towns where, uh, you know, all the signs look the same. I mean, I don't want to go full Leavenworth where everything's, you know, all German like that and everything. But it looks nice when you go to those towns and people go to Leavenworth because they like that atmosphere. I'd like people to come to Des Moines because there is an atmosphere of cohesiveness in the downtown area. Um, and I put together a proposal um, to help make that happen. Uh, in our town, so it's not a burden on our small business owners to, you know, put new signs up and everything, you know, and for new businesses that come in as well. Um, I have a master's in cybersecurity. I've been doing IT work for about 20 years or so. Um, I like to solve problems. Uh, that's why I got involved in that. And uh, in today's climate, with um, with all the ransomware and uh, files getting hijacked and uh, and everything, um, having somebody on the council that really understands that aspect that I've been doing for the last 20 years, um, I think would be a good addition to our council as well. Um, it's, just, it's the new times that we live in. Things have changed so much in just the last four or five years uh, on that level, and, um, and that's just another aspect of crime as well. Um, I'm not even going to use all my time. Okay. That's okay. good. I'll take, I'll take some questions. You um, you talked about the, the, the economic development during the, like on the main street of, mm -hmm. of Des Moines. We it's from from the candidates that I've heard. I mean, our biggest our biggest push right now is for the marina development. Right. But the marina development is going to take several years at least. Oh yeah. What I mean, so do we have to wait for the downtown part to develop? It? And do we have to wait for the marina before the rest of the downtown uh, starts developing more. The so it's one of those it's one of those catch twenty twos where well nobody's going to come until we do this nobody's going to come until we do this and so but if you don't but we don't have the money to do this unless the people come so you kind of have to be it's kind of like Thanksgiving dinner you got to be working on four or five different dishes at the same time and try and make it all come together at the same time um, the marine is getting. Uh, some work done right now, and that's great. It's going to be a good fa facelift for our front porch down there. Um, we, once that starts happening and businesses start seeing that, they're going to start developing a little bit more down there. And if we can get um, 
so a little more uh, cohesiveness to or uh, accessibility between the marina and like Seventh Avenue and Marine View Drive, then it'll be a more uh, uh, comprehensive experience when you go down there. Instead of I'm going down to the marina, I'm going to the restaurant. If you just go, I'm going downtown. You can do the marina, you can do the restaurant, you can do it all together, and that's that's my vision. For I mean that might be a might not even be a five year plan that might be a ten year plan down the road but it's baby steps you can't eat uh, you, eating a whole elephant starts with one bite right so you got to start somewhere other questions I covered it all all right apparently thank you, <laughs> thank you. all right. Playing this way, but the school board position is now up, um, and I don't, I don't believe uh, Angelica is not here. Okay, so we have uh, Jennifer Fichamba running for Highline School Board position number two. Um, good evening. First of all, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you this evening. My name is Jennifer Fichamba, and I'm an educator that's running for school board. I'm running for the Highline School Board Director Two position. Um, I have lived in the Highline School District my entire life. I'm a product of the Highline School Board, or not the school board. <laughs> I am a product of the Highline School District. I, got, I went to Grand Prix Heights Elementary, Sylvester Middle School, and I'm a proud alum of the Highline High School. Go Pirates. Um, I also have left a legacy here, as my son also attended Gregory Sylvester and just graduated this June from Highline High School as well. Um, I currently am a college and career counselor in the Tuck Willis School District of Foster High School. Prior to that, I worked in the Highline School District at Evergreen High School as a college and career specialist, and I also worked at Chinook Middle School working with students with special needs. Um, I have also participated, have been an active member in my local union, the Tuck Willis Education Association, as the vice president of my union. I've sat on two bargains for our union, so I understand the needs of the district as well as the needs of our educators and our students. I think that it's long overdue for school boards to have educators sitting on them um, because we know exactly the needs of our students and our families, which is part of why I'm running. I think that it's important that we're centering the voices of our stakeholders. Those are our students and our families, as well as our teachers and support staff in our buildings. Um, oftentimes decisions are made um, with regards to our students and with regards to curriculum and other programming that happens. And they invite our students, they invite our educators to the table when they've already basically decided what they're going to do. Maybe they have two different pieces of curriculum and they're like, choose between these two. However, there was a big vetting process that happened before that. And so I think it's really important that we bring those folks to the table sooner than later. We have a big responsibility coming up in Highline by selecting a new superintendent. And I've heard a lot of talk about um, council, or city council candidates that really find value in partnering with the school district. I agree. I think that a school district can't do it alone. A city can't do it alone. It takes a community to raise our children. And it's really important if, if I'm elected to school board that I will be partnering with my councils that I serve. Um, my service area will be Burien, but that does not mean I will be exclusively just partnering with the council in Burien. I will be working with Des Moines, SeaTac, Normandy Park, and White Center to make sure that the resources that are available, and there are resources out there, that we are doing it with authenticity, and we're making sure that we are bridging the gap for our families so that they understand what is available for them. I think it's really important that the cities um, and the school district work together because that's the way we can best serve our community, I believe. Um, I, think, I think I covered it all, but I'm willing to answer questions and I'm ready. <laughs> so. All right, questions? <laughs> no? if, if no one else has a question, I think it's appropriate you know, since this is- Sure, no, absolutely. Are you familiar with the design engineering program at Pacific Middle School? Funny you should ask that. I have been watching a lot of the school board meetings and I'm very aware that they've cut that program or are in the process of cutting that program. To me, it's really as a person who survived high school because I was participating in programs like theater, 
um, school newspaper and things like that. When programs like that cut, get cut, that really adversely affects our young people. Um, that all has to do with um, state testing, things like that. So when um, schools are not meeting their annual yearly progress, for example, oftentimes programs like that will get cut in order to put kids who are struggling in reading or math into more reading and math, which I can tell you as a person who struggled in math, that was the last place I wanted to be is in another math class. Programs like design and engineering is a great way for students who maybe are not fond of math, but are able to get math skills from a program like that. Um, I also believe that programs like theater, music, all of those support reading and math and science. It all is interchanging. Um, I would have never made it through high school if it wasn't for the art program that I was in, the theater program I was in at Highlight. Um, it's with because of my theater teacher that I graduated high school and then went on to college. If it wasn't for those programs, I would not be standing here today. Um, so I really do value programs such as that. Um, I see in my high school kids that really thrive in those kinds of programs. So, um, is that no, that's oh, okay. you. you that's um, so great. I do see how it's really important for them, and I will be a strong advocate for keeping programs like that because our kids need it. They need that outlet. It's not just about <coughs> English, math, and science. There's different ways to learn those skills. So, yes. Um, my wife was a paraeducator at, at Mount Rainier High School. Mm -hmm. And I noticed the, the, the discipline or the lack of discipline just keep getting worse and worse, year by year by year by year. <coughs> she was hurt a couple times and nothing ever, you know, the, the, I mean, I, I don't mean to, we have to punch kids, but there has to be some sort of discipline within the school systems. And it seems like we've walked away from that. And, and the kids know this. The kids know that they're, what they can do and what they can get away with. Um, what to be honest, like when it comes to things like discipline, it really depends on the administrator in the school. I've worked in schools where I've had administrators that fostered a really positive environment and a positive environment that kids were there to learn and that were very respectful. They brought different things to the table. But I've also worked with administrators that were checked out and that's when I find that more problems happen is when the administrators are not participatory. Um, I can think back to a few years at Highland High School. The students will tell you that the principal sat in her office most of the day and was never out in the community in a school <coughs> building. And a lot of things occurred. There was a lot of racism at the school. There was a lot of, um, not necessarily violence in that way, but like verbal violence between kids. Mm -hmm. and. Um, that is a result of an administrator that is just not in the but hallway. But isn't that the board's responsibility to... It is. And the, what the board did is they moved her to another school. That doesn't solve so the problem. So personally, it does not solve the problem for me. Like, I want to have the best administrators in my school buildings. Um, I think that that's really important. And I work with all kinds. Like, I work with all. I worked at the Evergreen Campus where they were three small schools. I had three administrators, and none of... There was... I worked... For there for like eight years, and out of the eight years, I had maybe two really solid administrators. And I had an administrator there that let kids basically run the school, and that's when you run into problems. And it is the school board's responsibility um, to make sure that the people that we're hiring are there for our kids and have the are there for the right reasons and not just there. I don't know, sometimes I don't know why they're there. But it is our responsibility, and that is something I would value very greatly. I've been able to hire a new principal at Foster High School. I was on the hiring community and committee, and I will say we got an outstanding principal at Foster. Um, I've also been on the committee to hire a superintendent in Highline because we fired one of our superintendents, and we have a really quality superintendent now who has a heart for kids, and I can see the dynamic in our district changing and the behavior of our kids changing as well because we have stronger administrators. So, yes. Um, I understand that the dress codes are totally gone now in the Highland School District. Um, I was, one of my granddaughters works in, in Des Moines and said that the young lady from Mount Rainier showed up where you can put the see through, no bra, totally 100% see through. Okay, I, I don't know. 
what school district would ever allow that other than the Highline School District? <laughs> would you go on in, or if you are elected, would you look into um, stopping? Well, I think that's a pretty sweeping statement to say that only the Highline School District has that policy. My son just graduated from Highline High School, and I can say that when I've been in attendance and I go to a lot of events at Highline as an alumni, um, I don't see dress code violations like that. And so I would say it's a sweeping statement to say that that is a Highline School District thing. However, I do think that we over-police our young women. And what you're describing is probably, is definitely not appropriate, but we do over-police our women, our young women, and how they're dressed. If I've seen girls sent home because like they have a sweater that comes down a little bit, and that's a dress code violation. So we have to have a balance. We cannot be over-policing our young girls and saying they're a distraction. Our boys also have to learn how to behave around, young, around girls as well. I have young girls in my school that are very well developed, and you know, they're dressed, they're covered completely, but they've been called on dress code violation because their t-shirt that covers everything is too tight. So there has to be a balance. Um, what you're describing is definitely extreme, and of course that should be addressed. However, oftentimes our young girls are police at a higher level than our young boys are. And so there has to be a balance. But I do think it's sweeping to say it's only the Highland School District, and it is the Highland School District that has these policies. Because I don't agree well, with that. Well, I guess I, what, the way I look at it is that um, I know students, um, good students, have actually had to leave the Highline School District. Well, their parents actually put them in Kennedy or, or went to Federal Way. I would like to qualify, like, understand what you mean by a good student because personally, I kept my child in the Highline School District. I have a lot of friends that he grew up with that are girls that are stayed in the Highline School District, all of which are outstanding young people that have gone on to college, have gone into apprenticeship programs. So. When you say good students, that's a like a pretty charged statement to say. We have a lot of outstanding students in the Highland School District. Outstanding. And to make statements like, well, the good students have been taken to a Kennedy High School or somewhere else is a very charged statement, and I don't totally appreciate it as a parent of a student in Highline. I'm sorry, I know it's getting late, but I did have one. I think it's important to um, have some idea. How do you think? that schools can help a lot of students who are now far behind because of COVID um, the catch up in our education system? So like some of the things that need to happen is really building partnerships to make sure that we have um, extra tutoring available to our young people. Um, I think like um, Jean was saying, like having a partnership with the um, community centers. I know in Burien, the Burien Community Center has a robust after school program at both Sylvester and Highland High School where they do offer tutoring plus enrichment activities. And I think that's how you support our young people. Um, and I also just wanna like kill this misnomer that our kids are so far behind. Our kids learned a lot in the last year. They learned resilience. They learned how to overcome adversity in a time where I mean, it was a struggle. And as an educator too, we also learned a lot. We had to learn how to educate our young people in a time where we, that's not the normal way of doing things. And I can tell you our kids were showing up and I've seen our kids perform in this environment that is totally different, but they did learn a lot. And did they learn the classic way of learning? They didn't, but they also learned some many, many great life skills that will help them in their future. So. Um, I think the partnership in having after school programs, robust after school programs with tutoring and part of it will be what's helping our students. Anybody? Okay. Yeah. Actually, I think that that's a, the, the idea of tutoring I wanted to bring up to you, David. There are so many retired teachers here. I would be happy to, you know, like have one night a, a month. Er, you know, a retired teacher sits at every. I can teach reading. I can teach math. I can teach uh, writing. I mean, I can teach reading and writing at high levels. I mean, clear through. Now, my math, basic computation, and then forget it. But a math teacher once told me, all you have to be is a person, and then you have to do math. 
because I also say that, but yeah, um, but I agree. You know, other than other than you know, like it's a computation. I will, I will like, say that like we would really appreciate as a person who works in the school, we would appreciate community offering to help out in our after school programs because at Foster we have after school program. You have to be vaccinated to be in our schools. That is a caveat, and so. But we are we always are willing to have them of course, people come in and work with our young people. It's such an advantage, really. Mm -hmm. So but it's just one night, a, one night a, a you know one night a week. Just have no, we actually do have something that's already going on. Don't we have one night a week where we have we have one group that comes in on one day a week to uh, tutor kids that are trying to get. Yeah, we actually do already have something started here. And we, we donate the hall, so. Oh, but it's, yeah. it's important because it would be great to, as an educator to know like these resources and then that way I'm able to partner. Right, yeah. I didn't you know, know, and I think sometimes that. that's the missing link is that we haven't like access, we don't know all the resources and if we're making true partnerships with our cities, then we're able to like filter our kids and our families to y'all, so. So, uh, also Gregor Heights. Yay, Gregor Heights. Highland. Yeah. Um, so, in 94 when I graduated from Highland, it was still a mess. So you got a lot of work ahead of you. What would be your first thing that you would go after if you got elected? Well, I think the first thing that I'm excited about doing is hiring a superintendent that puts kids at the center of the decisions that are made. I think that we've had a superintendent that is very good at like talking a good talk, but she doesn't really involve the students in the way that, and the families in the way that she should be. Um, I've seen it as a person who worked in the district. I've seen it as a parent. And so I think our opportunity is having leadership in our district that will help bring our community together in a more sincere way and really like taking our kids and like really getting to know them by name, strength, and need, which is her thing. I had a superintendent that I worked with in Tukwila who was really invested in the kids and the kids knew who she was and they knew that they could count on her for support and that really made an impact for our young people. Um, she went on to a different, she moved out of the state with her husband, but um, I think that that's really important is having leadership in the district that really stands behind what they're saying, that they know kids by name, strength, and need. Because I can tell you the superintendent did not know my son at all. And Fitchamba is not like a hard name to forget. I mean, there's only he and I, like, well, and his dad, but his dad doesn't live here. Um, so, you know. Um, I think that's really important is having leadership that really values our kids and really values our students' voice because it's their education and we're all here to help them get to the next level. So I hope that answered your question. It helped, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> we go to our list of candidates. And again, I appreciate all the candidates' time that you came and, and, and Gave us. I mean, it's, we're not a big club, we're not, it's not a huge community, not a huge turnout, but we really do appreciate your time and, and effort to show up here and, and talk to us about you know, where we should check off on the top. Oh, hold on. So I just wanted to let, let you all know that there's um, literature back here for me to, from the candidates that brought it. If you'd like to see, read a little bit about some of us, um, I think most of us brought some. Take a, take a cruise along the back table. Alright, thank you. Okay.